Hey plant biologists, I'm back and this is the third uh, video screencast about chapter 23. This one will focus on vascular and dermal tissues. Um, and let's just get started if I can manage it. Okay, so I'm going to jump right into it. So if you'll remember, there are three kinds of tissues, a ground tissue, which we covered in the last video, and then vascular and dermal tissue. Vascular tissue is uh, tissue in plants that has a similar function to vascular tissue in animals. It is responsible for the transport of water, minerals, and sugars and other nutrients throughout the plant. So the location of vascular tissues in plants is in small tubular bundles that um, uh, connect from the roots of the plant all the way up through the stem and into every single leaf so that all cells in the growing plant are only a few cells away from one of the vascular bundles. Um, there are two broad kinds of vascular tissues in vascular plants. These include xylem and phloem and they come together as a pair, but we're gonna talk about them separately. So xylem cells are really interesting because they are actually dead um, in order to be useful. So xylem cells are dead at maturity. That means they have thick uh, secondary cell walls um, and they actually are usually have pits or perforations at the end. So they're tubular or cylindrical cells and they have holes at either end, kind of like uh, drinking straws or pieces of macaroni. Their function is to move water from the roots up through the stem and out through the leaves. Phloem cells are a little bit more complicated. There are two kinds of cells that are work together in phloem tissue, and we'll talk about them more later. The main thing to know about phloem cells in general is that they are alive at maturity. Um, however, they have some interesting internal structures that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, Phloem cells are alive, meaning they have uh, membranes capable of active transport. And that's important to remember because the function of phloem cells is to move uh, photosynthates or sugars um, in all directions in the plant. So uh, the, even though they are made into tubes and the cells are stacked on top of each other, similar to xylem, um, phloem cells need to move sometimes sugars from the leaves, the photosynthesizing leaves, through to the storage organs of the plant, but sometimes they actually need to um, mobilize the storage uh, carbohydrates and move them back up through the um, new growing tissues. So sugars need to move in both directions, whereas water only moves up. So that's an important distinction between xylem and phloem. Okay, a little bit more about xylem. There are two primary xylem cell types. Both of these are dead at maturity, meaning that they don't have cytoplasm, a nucleus, plastids, or anything except thick secondary cell walls that have lignin in them. So the lignin is water um, impermeable. Um, so in order to actually move water um, th through these cells, there actually have to be holes or pits in the cell. Um, sometimes pits and sometimes larger holes that we call perforations. There's two kinds of uh, xylem cells, tracheids, which tend to be thinner um, and have uh, adjacent pits um, between two adjacent tracheid cells. So these tracheids sort of stack one on top of another um, such that they the water can move through um, the pits from one cell into the next cell. Um, these are very uh, common in gymnosperms. It's the only kind of vascular tissue uh, or xylem tissue that is found in gymnosperms or um, like conifer trees. Um, they're, they tend to be thinner and narrower than the other kind of cells, which are vessel elements. So vessel elements are found in flowering plants or angiosperms, and they are uh, stouter. They're sort of uh, smaller and uh, with a wider circumference, and they have much larger holes or perforations on the ends of the cells. So there's a lot of space for the water to move from one cell to the next. Um, this allows very, very efficient transfer of water in vessel elements, which is one of the reasons people think that 
um, plants that are uh, that have vessel elements were able to sort of take over the world. Angiosperms are much more common um, than uh, gymnosperms, especially in places where there's a lot of water and very little freezing. It turns out that there's some interesting questions about uh, air bubbles. So vessel elements, even though they transmit water very efficiently, also have the drawback of sometimes getting air bubbles and or embolisms. And if you get an air bubble in a stack of vessel elements, you end up not being able to move water through those cells anymore. Okay. Um, here are some lovely pictures of xylem cells from um, photomicrographs. You can see they're similar to the diagrams that I showed you before. There's more information about these in your textbook, but right now what I want to do is sh uh, give the screen over to my very, very uh, best friend in life, not really, but sort of, uh, Sir David Attenborough. And so we'll see a short video about xylem transport if this works. Okay, what's going on here? These aren't plants. This is a fireman. All right, he's attaching a hose. Oh, who's that? It's Sir David! He's a young man. He's up on a hook and ladder truck. It's a pump-lift jet of water, 70 feet up in the air here. It takes a huge, big, noisy engine down there. But this tree pumps up about 100 gallons every hour and manages to do so in total silence. How? How indeed, Sir David. I love him so much. The answer is to be found in the tree's trunk. The central part of this is wood. Around the outside of this pillar, there are ranks of hair-thin pipes. Those immediately beneath the bark carry the food-laden sap down from the leaves. That's the phloem. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're moving towards the xylem. The xylem's toward the center of the plant. The phloem is on the outside. Farther inside the trunk, there's another set of tubes. These are the ones that carry the water up. They are continuous pipes that extend the whole length of the trunk. And into the roots. Okay, imagine you're at one little the water bit of water, the leaves above, moving through the tight The long, thin the threads of it are pulled up the tubes, into the branches, and ultimately into the leaves themselves. Now we're in a leaf. There's some chloroplasts. Some of it is used in the food making process. This is... The rest evaporates. Now we're out of the xylem and we're in the parenchyma. <gasps> we're about to go out the dermal tissue. Woo! All right, that was exciting. Uh... See if I can get back to my slides. All right, so um, I forgot to mention that xylem is wood, right? So when you talk about a xylophone, a xylophone is like a, a, a wood instrument. Um, so xylem means is wood tissue um, later, but before it's uh, sort of solid wood, it is water transmitting tissue. All right, moving on. So one little bit about how um, xylem elements form. Xylem elements form through this really cool process of programmed cell death. So here we have meristematic cells, right? And that this cell is going to become a xylem cell. What has to happen is that the walls sort of have to dissolve um, at the perforation site where there's going to be big uh, gaps in the cell walls. At the same time, because the cell is thickening and uh, the cell, secondary cell wall is developing, we're getting um, thick cell walls, often in um, bands, and the nucleus degenerates, the cytoplasm sort of dissipates, and the, um, uh, the vacuole also uh, dissipates. And so in a uh, mature xylem cell, we have basically holes between the two cells, so if this is one whole cell, it's sort of a slice through it, it's got solid walls along the, um, the long part of the cylinder, but the tops and the bottoms of the cylinder are basically dissolved, so water can move through like a straw. Isn't that cool? So it's basically a programmed cell death. There's some really interesting cell biology about that, which I'm not going to go into right now, but you can read about it, and if, let me know if you need more information.
Okay, a little bit about phloem. So phloem cells and angiosperms, again, are alive at maturity. And the main kind of uh, phloem cells that I'm going to talk about are those that are in the flowering plants, because they're my favorite, angiosperms. Um, and in angiosperms, there are two kinds of phloem cells that always work together, and they're the daughters of a single mother cell. So the two types of cells are sieve tube elements, and it's the sieve tube elements that actually move the sugars um, in both directions. And they're alive, but they're kind of weird because they have um, no vacuole, and they don't have any plastids, and they don't even have a nucleus. So they basically are big bags of cytoplasm and sugar and they allow um, sugar to be transported easily because there are lots of plasmodesmata between the sieve tube elements. So this is a sieve tube element, and here's another sieve tube element, and between them is a plate that has lots and lots of plasmodesmata that allow the sugar to move through the cytoplasm of the cells very easily and without any obstruction from plastids or nuclei or Golgi apparatus or anything like that. So the problem is though that those sieve tube elements work really well to transport sugar, but they can't actually um, uh, express their own genes. So next to them, right next to them, there are companion cells. So companion cells are these here. These cells here are cells that actually um, they're really thin, but they have a nucleus, they have a lot of gene expression, they have a lot of Golgi, and they're kind of directing the action of the sib tube element. So they work in a concert with one another, and the companion cells are kind of telling the sieve tube elements where to bring the sugar and in which direction, etc. I'm very much oversimplifying this. There's a lot of really great information about this, which I hope we'll get to later in this class, or if you want to read about it, it's in another chapter, and I'll tell you about it later. Okay, so just a very brief description of how a sieve tube elements and a companion cells uh, develop. So here we have a more meristematic cell. So this is a cell that's going to become the sieve tube element and the companion cell. And you can see the nucleus of the cell is dividing, so it's going to be two nuclei at first. Um, but you'll also see that um, the companion cell has very little uh, vacuole, but it does have a nucleus. And here what we have is the um, the vacuole and a bunch of cytoplasm and then these P protein bodies which eventually are going to help with the um, movement of the sugars. All right, so now this is going to become the companion cell and this will be the sieve tube element um, as part of the tube moving sugars. Um, in this situation here, in the next step we have the developing pores. That's where the sugars are going to move through the plasmodesmata. You have the disintegration of the vacuole. Meanwhile, in the sieve tube, uh, I mean sorry, the companion cell, the nucleus is still here. Um, by this point, the nucleus and the vacuole and basically everything else of the sieve tube element has uh, dissipated and dissolved and mainly everything that's left is a, a, a membrane that's allowing the transport of sugar between cells. So that's pretty cool. Here's some close-up views of phloem. So here's this companion cell with its active Golgi and um, and plastids sort of uh, making sure that the sieve tube element is knowing what's going on. The endoplasmic reticulum actually kind of moves through the two cell walls, and the sieve tube element is largely blank, actually. So here we have sieve tube elements, and the companion cells are really small, and next each one is associated with another, like there's always come in pairs. All right, so overall, here's one vascular bundle. We've got all of the different kinds of cell types we've talked about, and I'm going to leave you to be able to describe the structure and function of all of these different kinds of cells. The one thing that I'll leave you with is that, in general, xylem is located, if you've got a vascular bundle, you've got a, a xylem and phloem together, and usually the xylem is towards the inside of the plant, and the phloem is towards the outside, within a stem, anyways. Okay, 
very briefly, I hope, about dermal tissue. So I'm moving on from vascular to the last kind of uh, vascular tissue that we're going to talk about. I mean, sorry, the last type of primary plant tissue that we're going to talk about, dermal tissue. Dermal tissue is found at the, as the outer layer of the plant on the leaves, uh, stems, and roots. It's not found right at the very tips of the roots, but it's basically everywhere else. It's usually only one or two or a few cell layers thick. And there are a few cell types types. The most common kind of dermal tissue are what I call um, pavement cells, which are these puzzle-shaped cells that are sort of closely linked together and they form almost a skin on the outside of the plant, which is why we call the external layer of cells the epidermis, similar to our skin, which is also called epidermis. So these cells here um, um, in the pavement cells are mostly for protection. Um, they secrete the cuticle, which we've talked about before, the waxy cuticle that um, helps maintain uh, the water inside the plant and has a bunch of other functions as well. Um, there are also cells on the epidermis that are stomata, which we'll talk about. Um, sorry, the cells are not stomata, but the guard cells surround the pores, which we call stomata. We also have trichome bearing cells, um, which are cells that have uh, extensions of the cell wall, ex uh, increasing their surface area and allowing the cell to have like a hair coming out of it. Um, and then we're also root hairs, which are a, um, a special version of a trichome or um, one of those cell extensions. Okay, so dermal tissue can have a lot of important functions, including gas exchange, um, water absorption, protection of the plant, and retention of water. So dermal tissue is actually responsible for both water absorption and water retention inside the plant, which is kind of cool. It's basically everything that happens at the layer of the, the boundary between the plant and the rest of its world. Okay, so really quickly, I just want to remind you that stomata are awesome. You can look at them on the surface of the, of the leaves, generally on the bottom of the surface, and they're surrounded by specialized guard cells. So guard cells uh, come in pairs as well. They surround a pore, which can be open if the plant has enough water to keep the um, guard cells turgid and open. If the plant loses water in its leaves, the cells kind of collapse and close the stomata as pictured here. And stomata come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, um, and they're just generally cool. Stems can have stomata too, just FYI. That's just a cool factoid. All right, a little bit about the dermal uh, tissue um, cell types that have trichome. So trichome bearing cells are often found on leaves and stems, the above ground parts of the plant. Not all plants have trichomes, but many do. And the above ground trichomes can have many different functions. Sometimes they are glandular and they might hold some kind of uh, uh, secondary compound that might be secreted. Um, sometimes there are many, many trichomes and they're white and they're reflective of bright light. That's really common in desert plants. Sometimes they secrete salt that the plant accumulates in salty areas. Um, I'll just, as a side note, say that trichomes are now a many, many, many million dollar business um, in some states, for example, Illinois, California, Colorado, um, THC is a chemical that is secreted by trichomes in the genus cannabis, um, just FYI. So trichomes can be big business. I want to finally talk about root hairs as um, root hairs are also trichomes um, and root hairs are um, also extensions of single uh, epidermal cells. And so I think you can see that in this weird drawing. So here's a single epidermal sort of pavement cell and each one of those cells has a single um, sort of ex uh, extension coming out of it. So the cell has greatly increased surface area. As a result, it's really good at absorbing water because um, the cell wall is really thin. The cytoplasm goes into the cell wall and, or I mean, sorry, into the trichome and water can be absorbed from the environment 
environment into those root hairs and then transmitted to the xylem, which then uh, causes it to flow through the vascular tissue. So these epidermal uh, root trichomes, otherwise known as root hairs, are absolutely crucial to uh, allowing the roots to have enough water um, for the rest of the plant. They're essential for water absorption from soil. Um, Da, 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 da. Okay, so they have increased surface area. I said all this. Um, I'll leave you with these questions for thought and you have questions about them or if you don't know the answer, you can check with me either on email or on the forum or office hours. I want to leave you um, with a short video of root hairs growing because I think here is a way for you to tell that we're dealing with uh, individual cells that are growing and this is a really quick video. So here's the epidermis of the cell, and here are individual root hairs which are growing. Um, those are only right above the root uh, tip, so these are the cells that are just recently produced by the apical meristem. And I think you can see that there's cytoplasm flowing in them. Oh yeah, here you go. And so water can be absorbed all the way around the edges of those uh, root hairs, and um, that allows the plant to get enough water because if you think of all the little root tips all of them have millions of little root hairs on them so that's a lot of water absorption all right so that's all i'm going to say <laughs> not that that's not enough about um uh, all the different cell types and i just want to remind you that every single cell type that i mentioned has the uh, um the ultimate sort of origin of it was an apical meristem cell the apical meristem gave rise to three different sub meristems the protoderm which gives rise to all the different kinds of uh, dermal tissues pavement cells guard cells and trichome bearing cells um, the ground meristem gives rise to parenchyma and then colenchyma and sclerenchyma as well and that the apical meristem gives rise to the procambium and the procambium gives rise to both uh, xylem and phloem including both sieve, uh, uh, sieve tube elements and companion cells so if you want more information definitely read the textbook it has a lot of more detail um, and I'll be back with you soon to talk about uh, plant organs of which there are also only a few types stems leaves and roots but there's a lot of different variations within there in the meantime stay safe and have uh, an excellent uh, weekend and I will hopefully see or talk to you soon take care everyone